Hi there, I'm Graham Fitch and I am the co-founder of the Online Academy and it's a pleasure to welcome you to this month's live Facebook clinic. Um, so please do uh, let me know where you're watching from and click all the relevant buttons and if you're watching this on YouTube and you'd like to know uh, more about what we're doing here then you do the usual things with the like and the subscribe and the notifications bell so yes great well lovely to see you except that I can't see you yet so I'm just assuming that people will gradually arrive yeah there we go we've got two people there <laughs> more will come as we go on that's great okay so let's start Janet hello there um, I'm going to start off with a question from Marilyn who asks this, or who says this, I have been working on Mozart Sonata in G major K283 for quite a while. It seems I am constantly working on getting pieces up to speed. The trills in this piece, as well as others, always seem to slow me down. I know you aren't always a fan of the metronome, but it works well for me. It is the best way I have had of keeping a steady tempo on this piece. Any other suggestions? Actually, that wasn't the first question I was going to start with, but let me just move all of this stuff out of the way and get to that question from Marilyn. Um, and then I'll do the other question after. So, yeah, this is the, the sonata that, that Marilyn's mentioning, um, that she's struggling to get up to speed and presumably being consistent with the, the tempo. And then is the metronome a good idea for practice? The problem with the metronome um, is that it's a mechanical device. Uh, it, it's outside of us. It doesn't breathe. Um, and I always ask people, are you really listening to the metronome when you practice? If you are and you find that it helps anchor you to the beat, then obviously it's a, it, it can be a very useful tool in our practice. But it's only one way of uh, practicing and I, I really wonder if it um, instills a sense of rhythm or whether it just shows us where we might be speeding up and slowing down. I think those two things are quite different. We've really got to find um, an inner sense of pulse that for me comes from the body. It can't come from the head. It's not a question of counting one, two, three, but feeling one, two, Three. So if you watch, there are certain pianists who, when they play, you can absolutely see them almost dancing at the keyboard. And I don't mean that in any grotesque way, but their body is alive to the music, um, to the rhythm of the music. Andra Schiff being one of them, he doesn't make very many movements at all, but you can feel that he's always almost conducting. Um... <laughs> So if I were wanting to develop that sense of inner conducting, I would just have a, a pencil or something and I could either listen to a recording and, and conduct the recording. And I don't have to be a, a good conductor to do that. I'll show you. I'm not a conductor at all, but I can show you the sorts of movements I would make. Or you could imagine the music in your inner ear, which I can do now. <laughs> and make kind of vocalizations based on probably the melodic line and if you can sing it can you see what's happening with my conducting stick i'm tending in my left hand to give the downbeats and it's probably bad conducting from the point of view of a real conductor but you could give downbeats with the left hand one two one, two, three, and then show the down beat in the right hand, if you're right-handed, and then across and then up. Doesn't matter which way you go, don't worry about the theoretical rules of conducting, as long as the down beats are with the down movement and the outside, the, what, the, the, what in Dalcroze is called a metacrucis, goes to the side. So one is crucis, two is metacrucis, three is anacrucis, which would want to come up. Um, that's a very good thing to do. Now, you could also conduct with 
one hand or mark time with one hand. And the other way around, left. another thing that you could do when you're practicing hands separately. Use the other hand to feel the pulse, to, to create the pulse. You do it on your knee. You can build a louder tap for the first beat, um, weaker taps for the second and the third beats. Now the other thing I would um, encourage doing, very much a part of my training, was to count, or is, to count out aloud when I practice. Uh, this came to me from Leon Fleischer, who recommended this for himself, he did it, um, to count out aloud during the process of practicing, obviously not all the time, but some of the time, vocalizing the beats is very helpful. One, two, three, 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 and so on. Um, if you can vocalize, what you're doing actually, you're having to concentrate on creating the vocalizations that are keeping the counting going, which takes up a certain amount of brain bandwidth, if you will. Um, so the benefit of it, when you stop doing the counting, not only are you very aware of the pulse and, and how each note fits with the one, two, three, but you've also freed up some brain space that you no longer need to use for the counting. So you've, you've got a little bonus there at the end. It's going to be easier to play than it was before. Another idea just for, um, I, I like to do this. It's like a matching up the tempo. You take a, you could be the beginning, but I don't think you'd get the tempo from the beginning. You might need to go down to somewhere like, well, I don't know, bar 27. <laughs> where you get a bunch of semiquavers or 16th notes or even here and what you do is you play a little bit it could be a couple of beats it could be a bar or so and then just stop and see if you can idle like like a car at a traffic light in idle and, and I'll show you what I mean let me just play a little bit of this now I go take that inner sense of pulse to back to either to the beginning or elsewhere and what's quite a neat trick is if you take the most difficult bar to play for yourself let's say it's it's that spot that I just went to bar 27 just keep referring back to bar 27 and dive around elsewhere almost randomly and just play a snippet here and there <laughs> literally diving around from one spot to the other. I could keep coming back to this. Let me do. See what I'm doing there? Just flitting around capriciously and using the most difficult bar as my moderator, if you will. Um, that's helpful. Now, just to address your question for the trills there, Marilyn, yeah, trills do tend to slow people down. I think it's because when, when we play them fast, we're not really able to hear how many notes there are in them. So if I'm playing a, a cadential trill, really no idea how many notes I'm playing in that trill. I could figure them out, figure that out by slowing it down. Or is it triplet sixes? Is it uh, eights? Um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, two for the price of one. 
uh, we can get so far and only so far with that type of approach, useful as it is. But in the end, I don't think we can really uh, hear the, the trill, all of the notes of the trill. So we have to automate it. We have to set it so that it happens by itself. And the ear, I'm looking at the bar that probably that trips you up there, Marilyn, and that would be bar 43, probably. If I go from the bar before, let me do it a bit slower. <laughs> I, the ideal trill for that would be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight notes. Let me do very slowly. Now that's kind of hard to, to hear when it's fast. So I have to almost trust that that trill is going to work if I've practiced it slowly enough, but I actually have to let it go when I play and listen to the left hand. trill I'm not going to be listening to the trill or even attending to the trill I'm going to be listening to the left hand to make sure that's very stable so and that gives me um, presumably what I practiced now let's say you can't manage that many notes it's ideal to start on the upper note here so the upper auxiliary, which would mean starting on the A, and to put a termination on the end. That's the absolute best uh, way of doing the trill, but there would be those that may not be able to manage that, um, because it is very intricate, it's very fiddly. Um, what we could do is maybe to simplify the trill and just do a short trill. if there's anything else if you really wanted to uh, or just a turn maybe or even just an accecatura bare minimum that would be the bare minimum so from the maximum best trill to the minimum find your place along there um, if you've been struggling with, with it for, for that long, Marilyn, perhaps it's um, not the best, uh, whatever it is you do. I don't know what you do with the trill, but maybe you could re-jig re the trill. So, you know, um, other suggestions. Yes, I think use the metronome, but use it wisely, use it discerningly and, and experiment with those other ways of, of keeping time. Marilyn's got another question uh, relating to the C-sharp minor nocturne of... Chopin, um, the posthumous one. Now she says, I have spent much of my time on trills with that as well. Again, speed, tempo, a challenge. Um, she does say she's downloaded the practice sheet. Yes, I have my own edition of this, which the Online Academy uh, publishes with all sorts of, I hope, helpful practice suggestions. Um, the way we organize this edition is that there's there's an introduction that gives you the background to the piece and the various uh, relationships this piece has to the second concerto. And then we have the score, plain, pure score. Um, you can see that. And then what we do is we publish uh, another score which has annotations with QR codes. So you scan that and that links to a, a demonstration of something or other that I'm doing. And we've also got practice worksheets for the trill and for the famous coda at the back. So uh, this, this I think, I hope, um, is a very useful adjunct to a, a regular score so that you've got some practice ideas. Yes, yeah, so the, of course the, the famous introduction is followed by this, well let me do the introduction first because just because it's so lovely. Okay. <laughs> to use the left pedal here and play the repeat very dead make sure to lift the left pedal now here's the trill now yes okay 
let's just let's look at that trill because Marilyn does say that she spent much of her time on the trills. So it, 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 let's just unpack it mechanically. So what's what's involved mechanically in a trill? We've got to find the repetition point uh, of. In other words, if you think about what a trill is, it's a rapid alternation of, of two repeated notes. That, that note's repeated and the F sharp's repeated and I alternate those repetitions. So if I were to block one note from sounding, I'm going to block my F sharp by holding it down with my other hand. Let me do that trill. Can you hear there? I've got a, a repeated note and the same would be if I did it the other way, of course. I've blocked the G sharp from sounding. So what we need to do is to be able to ma first ma manage the repetitions. So if we do that from within the key, in other words, don't lift the key up fully. Now, what I like to do when I'm trilling or when I'm inside the key is to think of walking along the key. I can walk in and I can walk back. So I mobilize my arm. That mobility keeps me from getting tight. So what I could do next stage, let me do it with the other finger. Start off slowly and find that point. Do it with the pedal as well. Now I'm going to try it holding on to, let's say, my G sharp. Well, let me hold on to my F sharp because you can see it better. <laughs> so within the held note, I'm, I'm able to slide, of course, on that held note. And now see if I can manage the repetitions now with the other finger held down. Do the same thing. So there's mobility on that held finger. I'm just using it there as an anchor. Now, when I'm ready to play the trill, I could start off by doing it slowly. So this is a, a good exercise to do. You could set a metronome if you want. First of all, do it as quarters, crotchets, with the pedal down, and then eighths, quavers, triplets, triplet, sixteenths, semi-quavers, uh, triplets, eights, See, see how I, with a steady pulse, increased incrementally the note values very strictly. But we don't want to play the trill strictly. But it's not a bad idea to practice it strictly. And in my practice worksheets, let me go to the first one that I deal with that. Yeah, I, I have suggested a whole bunch of different metrical versions of the trill. Uh, so... What is this? Three triplets and a group of four. And then three triplets and then three groups of, uh, sorry, one triplet group. And then uh, a, a groups of eight. Here's groups of five. four at the end and, and I go on and il illustrate a few more possibilities there for m strict metrical practice in order that when we get there we can just be free to do whatever comes so what does come you see how much mobility there and I could trill there for hours and hours and hours without getting in the least bit tired. And then we've got more trills as we go along. Um, okay, now let me get back to Marilyn's specific question. I hope that will help you with the trills. She also says, I'm, I'm not sure how to manage the Fiori Toras, that's the flowery fast runs at the end. Practicing those sections is slow going. Um, these two pieces are very different styles with metronome working well for the Mozart piece, but not as much with the Chopin Nocturne. Thanks so much. Okay, let's look at the Fiori Toro groups at the end. Um, again, I'm going to use my practice worksheet for the coda. Um, let me just refresh your memory on it let me refresh my memory on it too by actually looking at the score for a moment um, okay excuse me while I find it here we go so 
when we finish uh, the, the, this trill, bar, bar 57. And then a, a long group. Now I hope you heard that how flexible that was. Um, there is this discussion, I've seen it and read about it where the left hand is supposed to be strictly in time and the right hand can then be free. Uh, I don't really fully buy that actually, <laughs> certainly not in this place. I think that what that means is the left hand is keeping time, uh, keeping the structure rhythmically, but not like a metronome, like a human, uh, like a conductor or like an accompanist. So if I were accompanying um, a singer who was doing this sort of stuff, the singer would not be chained to the beat. So the accompaniment and then this is the group of 35. I think it can take that amount of flexibility. Do not try and play it metronomically, Marilyn, but let's have a little look at what's involved in the right hand. Um, the first thing you need to do is to develop a leggero touch, which is, or leggerissimo touch, which is, even though the notes are marked with a great big legato slur, they are physically, we feel them like scratching, like a staccato. With the pedal down. So we, we would pedal, a, as we play that scale in the piece, it would be with the pedal. So do practice with the pedal too. Start off by just really very light finger scratches um, from the surface of the key. What I'm doing, I think you can see that. I'm plucking. I see somebody just liked that. Thank you for liking that. Uh, th this is the, the Russian way of doing this, uh, which I think is, uh, well, certainly what I was trained in. Uh, there are other ways of doing it where we feel the fingers are more operating from the bridge here as levers like this. That's another way of doing it. Or we could just feel the pizzicato, which can happen very fast. So that's a leggero scale. So if we play a, a scale of E major, um, which is effectively what this is, over the course of two or three octaves with that touch, do it with the pedal down as well. Now, okay, how do we uh, figure out a group of 18? I think, again, the best way to do this is, first of all, strictly, in order that you can then be free. So the 18, group of 18, divides itself up, in my book anyway, is four, 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 six. Three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, five, six, one doesn't have to be that, it could be something else. But um, if we are, let's say we're doing that, uh, then I could do a bit of chaining. So I just do the first group fast. And then maybe our next add a group. Let me do that a better. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one. There we go. Now let me add another group. And I work on the chaining, I can work on the chaining backwards as well. I can start with the last group and then add the group before. I'd have to figure out what the note was. Similarly, with the, with the big group of 35, what's 35 divided into 4? Well, I make it 8 plus 3 groups of 9. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and then 9, 9, 9. where those anchor points are and then get comfortable with that see if you can do it at the speed you could even start from where you stopped now see how that works and then on the way down as well and then when it comes to the performance for goodness sake, don't think about, oh, I must do in a group of eight and then a group of nine. And a group... No, when you come to uh, playing, be very free with this and just let your left hand follow. Simple as that. 
And if the left hand should come in slightly different places to how you planned when you practiced, then that's fine. Let that be. It might be different each time. But you'd want to come back to those anchor points where the hands can fit nicely together. That's what, that would be my recommendation. I can't imagine that metronome even being feasible with this piece, you know, if you think of how free it needs to be. I'm sure I'm out already with the metronome, and I should be out with the metronome. Thank you for your questions, Marilyn. Uh, let me go back now to the first question, which uh, I got this in the wrong order here. It, this was from April, who asks, do you have any tips for when you did it the wrong way from the start? I do pick apart the music to pieces and pretend I've never met them. Um, I am playing, and then April lists three pieces that she's playing. So what I thought, since there was no specific uh, question about each piece, that I just dip in to, to these pieces and just see. The first was the uh, B flat minor nocturne opus nine, number one, Chopin, um, this one. Most beautiful piece. So if you have done it the wrong way from the start, I would just recommend going back and just stripping the piece down to its bare essentials. And I am a great believer in separate hand practice. I know there, there are those who do not believe in it or like it um, because they feel that you're using different muscles, different motor skills. And then when you put it hands together again, you have to learn it differently. I'm very familiar with that argument, but I strongly believe that we need to be able to hear the, let's say, the left hand um, by itself and really be able to listen to this left hand. And have it sound amazing by itself. So if I would always play right hand and left hand together, I might not be aware of where my left hand is bumping or where it's legato break. So I would recommend when you play right hand by itself, well, let's, let's stick with the left hand first since I started there. There's all sorts of things you could do for practice. I'm a great believer in practicing sometimes without the pedal. So I'm gonna go for some really nice legato here. Now I'm using the Paderewski fingering is involves a pivot the third finger on the F so I could even practice holding that F loosely down be able to move the hand on the F pivot. all I'm doing is playing the notes that aren't F rhythmically now if you can't stretch that and, and please do not try if the hand objects um, then you can use a different fingering. Five, two, one, three, one, through five. Five, two, one, three, one, five would work. Excuse me, will I just rehydrate myself? And then when you practice it, left hand by itself, let's say you're without the pedal, be very aware of where you can play legato and where you have to break the legato. So for example, bar five, I have to break both of those from this group. I have to break this, but I can join here. Break, break. So my hand is very aware of where it is joining and where it's not joining, where the pedal will, will help me join. Then I can practice it with the pedal. I hope a beautiful art shape in the left hand I'm not just playing notes I'm creating what sort of contour a little rise here's my high point low point so 
There's a little bit of a kind of undulation going on underneath, which is what I want. So when I play from, um, play my right, sorry, I'm looking at people arriving and uh, seeing where you're from. There's Dilek from North Macedonia. How wonderful to see you. And nice to, nice of you to tune in. Um, right hand, you know, Chopin was always going for the vocal style. So never practice right hand by itself mechanically, always vocally sing it. How would you bend those notes? Just create the most beautiful sound that I can. Now with the Fioritura groups, again, if you've just watched my demonstration on the C sharp minor posthumous nocturne, we can do the same tricks here. got a floating triplet group which I place there at the end but I could also practice the triplets at the beginning float the triplet group around so that each time I practice it strictly it's different and then when I play let me do that better idea what note went with what other note because I had practiced it strictly then I was able to be free with it so I reckon coming back to that sort of practice very very useful uh, another thing you can do you know working on sound is what we're always after this lovely section here sotto voce um, let me do with the right notes this time on my right hand. There's so many things I could do for practice there. I could play just the top line by itself. Use the fingering that you're going to use and use pedal to join because you will have pedal there. Make it sound amazing. Play the thumb line by itself very lightly. You can do that against the left hand. do is to play with two hands the right hand part to get the voicing it's easy to voice with two hands 70% top 30% or is it 75 25 who knows up to you now having heard it once with two hands my two hands have made let's say the perfect demonstration because it's easy to do two hands now let me see if that demonstration can inform the one hand i've got the sound in my ear now you see i'd have to work on that last the balance there so i'm really really listening like crazy i'm using my ear i'm not doing anything mechanical here people also mentions the Schubert G flat, the impromptu, the Schubert G flat impromptu, um, which everybody seems to play, which are, uh, is a good testament to the piece, because of course it's, it's a miracle of a piece. So how would you practice this if you've done it wrong from the start, or if you just want to keep picking the pieces apart? Go back to the skeleton of the piece, which is top and bottom. Like a million dollars. I have a little kind of, how would I describe this, a game really, uh, where we where we give numbers from one to ten, where one is the least intensity and ten represents the highest points of intensity. So on that scale of one to ten, what number would I want to give this? This is a game, it's entirely uh, playful because it obviously can't ever be scientific. So let's say out of 10, I give this a six. 
I obviously don't want six, 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 six. So what would be the, the next ones? Would it be six, five, four? to a six maybe or could be even up as high as a seven six five four seven and then it, how soft is this is it down to a three probably not is it down to a to a five see what i'm doing there i'm just playing with an idea for measuring uh, intensity levels in a melodic line you could then just write the numbers out, write two series of numbers out and see if you can practice according to that scheme. And then, of course, when you play, forget all about that because it's just a, a little scaffold to hang your practice on. Um, let's say you're wanting to work a little bit on evenness in the right hand, with these sixes underneath. Slow practice is helpful, but only to a point. for complete evenness of my sixes which you could do every now and again um, just to make just to check in that these notes are really behaving themselves if you need a little bit of an accent for practice you'll remove it there 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 just place those notes to do there is just to make sure that the finger that plays on the beat is in in the in the groove of the beat and the subdivisions of the beat staccato practice is also very useful uh, the only caveat i would say for this piece is that ask yourself how long you want to hold on to that pinky finger for i had one student who came back uh, i just um, actually she had decided she wanted to play this piece and brought it for her first lesson and she said I've got pains in my hand and I said oh my goodness I always hate it when people say that and I looked at what she was doing she had quite small hands and she was clinging on to this top finger here clinging on to the B flat and playing these underneath notes with a lot of tension and it uh, I suggested to her that we really we've got a pedal down there how long do we need to hold that B flat on for release it at some point. Same here. You've got to be intelligent about this. If your hand is big enough, then it's actually quite nice to hold on because it keeps us in touch with that, uh, that key, that line. My hand is big enough to do that mobile underneath but if your hand isn't big enough or you feel tightness then let go of that note um, there's all sorts of other things that we could do here but uh, let's just keep it to, to that for now um, April also mentions the Greek Arietta which is a very lovely piece you know I often find uh, particularly amateur pianists tend to take on pieces that are very difficult and their, their entire repertoire is based on difficult pieces which Take them a while to master but if you would have in your repertoire a, a little group of pieces that are absolutely gorgeous um, and they're not difficult then then you've got something that you can just play and enjoy without putting too much work into the the greek arietta is short and very sweet you probably know it um. question we had uh, in no way metronomic the metronome would destroy this piece so I would never practice this piece with a metronome why uh, no need but again for, for practice in my opinion this is in my opinion we, everybody should always add in my opinion uh, so let's just look at the what the ingredients of this we've got a top tune a 
and expressively repeated notes, never play them the same, otherwise they sound percussive. If I do this, that's percussive. I want that to sound a melodic. So I just change the color and maybe give a little direction. And maybe a little bit less here. come back up again. I'm going to add my bass line. Variation. Now the accompaniment gives up. There are a lot of people struggle with that corner, but if you fill in the missing 16th note, semiquavers, and bend it here too, that but imagine when you play the uh, second beats it's not fast it's got to be beautiful timing a metronome would kill that completely let me play it metronomically and you'll hear how ridiculous it sounds I can't even do it let me do it. see if I can do it <laughs> singing, nor that. So there's a little space. Hover and take your time going down. And just a tip here, change pedal on this beat, but not, whoa, let me do that better, but not again here. You don't need to change the pedal there. Let me go through that again pedal here on the resolution, keep the pedal down, and now change. So another useful thing to do for practicing is to take the middle element and see if you can make that beautifully even without the pedal at the tempo, pass one hand to the other, the left hand passes gently to the to the right hand, and I want it to sound like it's in one hand, like this. So really listen. Don't forget to listen. <laughs> one of the, the most important thing in piano practice is, is to listen. I hope I have covered those questions uh, in enough depth for you to just go away and explore. Thank you all very much for sending in your questions. Thank you all very much for watching. And I hope this has been of some interest. And I look forward to seeing you very soon on Facebook Live and on YouTube.